أنشدت بسم الله ثم الحمد له فالله أهل الحمد إن الحمد له يا رب أنت كلما رزقتني رأيت خيرا سابغا لا حد له بك الرجاء وحبكم ربي سرى في القلب ثم زانه فجمله أنت الذي سترت ما يعيبني وجدت لي Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of The Green Room. We're not in the uh, typical studio setting, but we are joined with one of the legends of the da'wah. We're talking about someone who has more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> with, <laughs> well, uh, we're talking about the one and only Yasser Khadi. Doctor, how are you? I'm How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. 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 I'm very casual. I'm sitting in my uh, family's uh, living room here. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Completely very, very relaxed. And uh, by the way, I had no idea you were so tall, mashallah. <laughs> when you're sitting down, you don't know how tall you are. I thought you were like a mini giant walking up. <laughs> so you're what, seven foot? How much? No, no, no. Six foot six. Six foot six. six. Okay. Okay. I'm a solid five foot six. So, yeah, so a good yeah. one. one. One foot exact. Yani, Subhanallah. So, Subhanallah. I want to say from the beginning, I look up to you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say the same about you, actually, <laughs> but in a different way, a man way. Uh, what I found really interesting is that, obviously, like, um, we had the conversation before we started this, um, we're, we're having this podcast now, and obviously you're, you speak fluent Arabic. First question uh, that just came to mind, actually, wh why haven't you thought about doing dawah in Arabic? Oh, my God, because Arabic is not my mother tongue. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot speak Arabic fluently the way that I speak English, and I would feel very awkward. Uh, oh, well, to be honest, you seem completely fluent. I feel awkward too, firstly. Secondly, I, you know, one of the things I always preach is that people of knowledge should concentrate on their own cultures and societies. We should concentrate on the cultures we know best. Why should I get involved, deep dive into Arab cultures and societies about the minutia of stuff about this is I don't agree with this right as yeah. you know I'm a critic of outsourcing our fatawa I see you know we should not outsource our fatawa to scholars of any other culture mm -hmm. every culture every civilization every land should prioritize its own ulama mm -hmm. then if the alim himself or herself needs to go further up that's their job to do mm -hmm. but the ammi the person on the street asking the fatwa should not jump to another civilization but you know the one thing i would say though is that to be honest with you now from what i see from the sharq al-awsat the middle east region a lot of people look up to the west and if you because of your level of training in the in the western world as well as in the, in the middle east i think it would have a lot of stock going yeah, to i mean look i'm not really interested right now if i were to give generic talks in yeah. arabic i wouldn't mind but specific any yani, issues of how to move the da'wah forward of what to do in contextual circumstances yeah. i'll give you a simple example yeah. uh the the babri masjid yani, you know for, uh, the verdict that came out in india right yeah. I, I tweeted uh, about that, that it's disappointing and I'm hurt and it's a sad day for Muslims and whatnot, yeah. right? And that's a generic statement. One Indian Muslim tweeted back and said, what do you advise we do? Mm -hmm. And I said, it's not my position to advise right. you specifically what to do. Mm. I can speak umumat, general stuff, right. that this verdict that the Supreme Court gave is very painful. It's a sign of, you know, uh, the Muslims being more marginalized. This is a generic statement, okay? Yeah. Now, what should the Muslims of India do, even though ethnically my grandparents are from India, even though I visit to the land, you know, 10 times or whatever, but it's not my job or place to go specific. So I worry that if I start speaking in, in, in Arabic, I my, my culture is the Western culture. My land is America. I concentrate mm. in, in that. I feel confident. So I appreciate your suggestion. Yeah. Think about it. Uh, <laughs> okay, khala. I'll ask another question now on the point of knowing your own culture and your own paradigm. General advice, what do you think we need to prioritize in terms of moving the dawah forward? <laughs> that, that is not a general advice. That okay. Is very, it's, it depends on who's asking you the question and who you're talking to. Right, okay. The number one issue I think that every da'i should concentrate on wherever they are mm. is to increase the ruhaniyat, imaniyat of the people they're talking to. Right. The number one crisis generically is a lack of conviction and iman, right? It's just a weakness of iman. Mm -hmm. So every da'i, the, 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 the emphasis of the da'wah should be to increase the iman of the people they're talking to. Yes. That is across the board and across any country they're living in. So the issue of making the yaqeen and the, 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 the thiqa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the belief in this religion strong, the issue of their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Our problem, as you know, one of the main problems is 
يعني الله مستعان materialism is just the love of the dunya حب الدنيا mm. the issue of not sacrificing something for the deen mm-hmm. even if Muslims theor- theoretically believe they don't actually do so number one issue across the board increase that iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as for after this I would say this is based upon who the da'i is what their speciality is and what their context is mm-hmm. طيب, I want to ask a question now based on the fact that you, you mentioned a few key words that one of them was that one of the things anywhere in the world which will be kind of a constant if you like is iman yet um, raising the iman uh, a point of controversy <laughs> as we said we would talk about uh, one of the points of controversy uh, last time you came to the UK you had a um, podcast with uh, 21C and um, there was one point where people were talking about I know what you meant I know what you meant a lot of people because they have sort of done and they don't know what you meant they completely I would say you had to claim I'm they completely distorted what you tried to say when you said that um, basically that um, there's been a development in the creedal schools of thought in other words for example if you look at Ibn Taymiyyah or uh, Abu Hamid Ghazali or Abu Bakr al or whoever it is who is seen as Mumathil Rasmi if you like of the whatever strand they are upon um, then what they come with is not necessarily, like, let's say, for example, Ibn Taymiyyah, is not necessarily the, you cannot claim that this is the aqwal of the salaf, the pure, untainted, uh, you know, uh, creed of the Muslims, uh, and so on and so forth, that is, uh, hasn't gone, undergone developments because there's misail, there's issues that he had to deal with that the Sahaba did not have to deal with. And we can't say for sure that the Sahaba would have answered in the same way that he would answer. We can't say for sure. So this is, am I right in thinking? Issues, yeah. For every one of them. Yeah. Obviously for some issues we have explicit statements, yes. right? But the issues, the controversies that developed later in Islam. Yes. Yani we have to be accurate and fair and say, well, when our scholars, and they are our scholars, yes. responded to these claims, they did so upon the usul or the paradigm of their predecessors. Yes. But it's not necessarily the statements of right. their predecessors. Right. Yeah. This is what you meant. Yes. So, so when you were talking about development, because a lot of people were saying, okay, well, the, the development narrative, it's found in other religions, for example, the development of the Trinity. So the, the idea is that, well, for example, in the case of Christianity, the Holy Ghost didn't become God until 381, for example. So when, when the word development is used in conjunction with theological um, matters, a lot of people have the idea that, oh, what you mean is that the Haq wasn't realized until Ibn Taymiyyah came along. So that's not what you meant. No, I didn't mean this. However, yes. yeah. to put a caveat, again, yeah. I want to be specific yeah. because you're asking very deep questions. Yep. The problem comes with these types of questions is mm. you need advanced students of knowledge to contextualize and understand. You're asking in a podcast interview and it's like asking the average Muslim about Hanafi fiqh, yes. right? Like where do you think Hanafi fiqh came from? Where do you think Shafi fiqh came from? They don't have the tools to even understand to the more academic response when you say, mm. did Hanafi fiqh develop? Of course it did. Yes. Was Ibn Masud Hanafi? Was the process of Hanafi? Of course not. Yes. You understand? Yeah, yeah. There's a development that's taking place. Now, is Hanafi fiqh batil? Obviously not. Mm-hmm. Shafi fiqh batil? No. All I can say for the advanced students, as for the average Muslim, these questions are of no concern to them. Yes. I have said very clearly they should follow a school, and it's alhamdulillah, that's fine. They're not yes. expected to reinvent the wheel. Yes. But the intellectuals and the advanced students and the ulama and the scholars should understand. And unfortunately, in one strand of Islam, they don't. Mm-hmm. And even theology mm-hmm. has had fine-tuning and development. Yes. Just like the Madha Fiqhiyya. Yes. Allah did not reveal the Hanafi Madhab, did He? Mm-hmm. So frankly, He didn't reveal the books of Ibn Taymiyyah either. Uh-huh. Right? And Ibn Taymiyyah's discussions, analogies, methodologies are extrapolated from the past, but they are not revelations from Allah. Yeah, absolutely. So what, so what you're saying, so what you're not saying is this, to be very clear. You're not saying is that the closer we get to the source, it's, it's, it's likely to be less developed. In other words, would you agree with the premise, the overall methodological premise, that the further back you go, the purer the source is? The purer the source is, but also the less discussion taking place. Yes, fair enough. The less discussion. Therefore, mm-hmm. since they're pure, yeah. you, you do have the potential to think about what an alternative track might have done. That's a very deep point. What do you mean? Can you explain? Yeah. <laughs> the problem comes to go into depth here. You, this is an advanced class. So, yeah. what would have happened in fiqh, let's say, right? If some of the other Sahaba's positions became more mainstream than maybe Ibn Mas'ud's position. Oh, I see your point. But let's. Can I differentiate here between? Because obviously, in usul fiqh, to say that what do you call it? Um, 
the قول الصحابيز من الأدلة المختلفة فيها. Yeah, okay. Or أقوى عمل أهل المدينة for example. Yeah. Right? There were other أصول that were existent in the time of the Salaf. Yeah. Some of which flourished, others of which didn't. But that's fiqh. If we say عقيدة, if we do, if we do differentiate the two. Yeah. عقيدة generally speaking, the yeah. hadith of Jibril الحمد لله is متفق عليه mm. upon between all of the طوائف منتسبة إلى السنة. Yes. 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 The the details that have come. Mm. We don't find explicit statements from the Sahaba for most of these very advanced issues of aqidah. Mm-hmm. Right? That doesn't mean it's wrong. I'm simply mm-hmm. pointing out a fact. Yes. That controversies came in the second century, in the third century, in the fifth century. Which didn't exist in the first. Which didn't exist. Yeah. So the scholars who yantasibun ila salaf, the scholars yeah. who look to the Sahaba for sources yeah. of knowledge, right? They are looking back and they're trying to extrapolate what would they have said. Yes. And in this extrapolation, in the third, fourth, fifth century, mm-hmm. at times we've had a bit of a diversity of opinion. Yes. Okay. Yes. And within Sunni Islam. Yes. And this diversity of opinion eventually became orthodox versus unorthodox. Mm-hmm. But there was a time when it wasn't orthodox and unorthodox. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you, I give an example in my my Mamluk's podcast uh, last month. Yeah. The controversy over Imam Al Bukhari's statement of the Quran. Oh, the Khalq Quran thing. Yeah. He said about love the Quran. Okay. Right. Yeah. Imam Ahmed's statement. Yeah. Again. To not go into too much detail, mm. the reason why Bukhari became unpopular in his lifetime mm-hmm. and uh, Al-Dhuhali became popular mm-hmm. because Al-Dhuhali was quoting Imam Ahmad against Bukhari. Uh-huh. Remember this? Yeah, 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 yeah. over this, right? Yeah. Al-Dhuhali was quoting Imam Ahmad and he's saying Bukhari mm-hmm. is contra Imam Ahmad. Mm-hmm. And who do you think Bukhari is against Imam Ahmad, the, the lion and the giant, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, later historians, we are taught that, oh, this and that, and we just gloss over it. Mm-hmm. The fact of the matter is, Bukhari is pushing the boundary. Yeah. Bukhari is rethinking deeper and finer. Mm-hmm. Right? Could you say the same thing about uh, uh, Ahmad and his aqwal about Abu Hanifa as well? I would definitely, yeah. this is another awkward topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May Allah forgive the both of them, Imam Ahmad's position. Again, you, most people don't even know this issue. Yeah, I don't know, I don't want to bring it, uh, fine, 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 fine. See, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough, fair enough. I, 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 one of the problems comes, and I've said this again, yeah. is the democratization of knowledge, the yeah. ease of access, where really advanced topics, which should not be discussed online or in YouTube, yeah. unfortunately are being discussed. Right? Fair enough. And I'm, I'm very conscious of this. Some of the people who criticize me or others, they're criticizing aspects that are very advanced, and I don't intend for them to be public anyway. I might have said it in a private audience or an email list, for example. And people who don't have understanding or the khalfiyya or the dirasat or whatnot, they take these yes. snippets and they make a bigger deal. Yeah. It's not my job to confuse the masses. Time. I wish I could take an advanced group of students yes. in Aqidah yes. and go over very these issues in a much more advanced manner. My only point, why did I say this in public, was very simple. Mm. Dear average Muslim, don't hate on another Sunni Muslim who disagrees with you in the finer details of Aqidah. Right. That's really the point I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. But would, okay, let, let me uh, specify the question. For example, fi bab al sifat in, in terms of asma and sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attributes, names and attributes of Allah, would you say that, would you recommend or say or accept that a methodological stance which says that go back to, for example, Qawl ibn Abbas, going back to Tabari, see what ibn Abbas says, if the Senate is Sahih, for example, when he's describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would that be an acceptable recourse for you? Or would you say that Ibn Abbas is not as good or uh, potentially is, 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 part of a, is part of a plurality of opinions, all of which can be accepted? No, I think it is historically clear mm. that Asma wa Sifat, the earliest Muslims who ascribed themselves to the Sunnah, yeah. affirm the attributes without thinking about their modality. Yeah. Bila I mm. think that's very clear. Yeah. In my PhD dissertation, I talked about over a hundred pages, the genesis of the Ash'ari Athari divide. Yes. The earliest, you know, manifestations of that. Yes. And I mentioned that for a period of time, this division was not even clear mm-hmm. because it's within the same strand, mm-hmm. right? You have people kind of gravitating this way, people gravitating that way. And it wasn't a clear cut division. Ibn Taymiyyah himself mentions this, right? And again, later scholars have their projections and colorings. Ibn Taymiyyah himself says that the Ash'a'ira and the Ahl al-Sunnah or the Atharis were essentially one until the Fitnat al-Qushayri took place in, ah. in, in Baghdad. Right? Mm. They were considered one against the Mu'tazira. These, mm. these were simply strands within generic Sunni Islam. Mm-hmm. These strands became more and more pronounced as time developed. Mm-hmm. But Al-Bayhaqi did not view himself as being of a different strand than Ahmad ibn Hanbal, for example. right? 
And we, even within the Ash'ari strand, there were multiple understandings. And Bayhaqi is one, Ibn Fawraq is another, mm. and Juwaini is another. Mm. And a Juwaini strand, because of his student Ghazali, mm. became the more prominent one. But when Juwaini was alive, these were all variant strands within Ash'arism, which was itself kind of sort of attached to Atharism, mm -hmm. right? There wasn't this clear-cut division yes. that we later have. Right. And I'm just trying to point out that in my humble opinion, especially given the current world we live in, yes. we need to minimize this sectarian divide between your average Sufi, your average Salafi. Stop fighting and hating upon one another. These differences, you find the genesis of them in the third, fourth century of Islam. Mm -hmm. Imam Ahmad's contemporary is the Muhasibi. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And Muhasibi was very popular in his time. Yeah. Imam Ahmad didn't like him. That's great. Okay, we understand. We love Imam Ahmad. But Muhasibi was alive and preaching at the time of Imam Ahmad. Mm. Which of the two is more Salafi than the other? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, that's what I'm yeah, trying to say. Yeah, yeah. He's also a preacher and teacher. Right? Uh -huh. Now, we might prefer, I'm saying we might prefer mm. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal mm -hmm. over Muhasibi. Mm -hmm. But let's be fair, they were chrono chronologically at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they're both preaching versions slightly different that eventually become two larger strands. Ibn Taymiyyah and Ghazali, for example. Yes. Ghazali is much more Muhasibi type. Mm -hmm. And Ibn Taymiyyah is much more Ibn Hanbal type. Mm -hmm. But the genesis is taking place. But no one will take either of them from Ahl Sunnah al uh, In my opinion, yeah, yeah. they are. Yeah. You know this. I, yeah. I'm very clear yeah, yeah. about this. They are within the broad you know, understanding of Sunni Islam. Mm. Uh, that, that yeah, 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 that makes clear. That's very, it's very clear. But the, the idea is that, no, it's good that you mentioned the fact that so you don't believe in a development narrative where no, not yeah. radically different beliefs come. Yeah, 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 yeah. However, the fine tuning and also the the, the more detailed aspects of mm. theology, and these detailed aspects are generally not taught to the average Muslims in khutbas, right? Yeah. The more detailed aspects are discussed in the more advanced textbooks. Mm -hmm. These advanced textbooks, obviously, they're being written at a time and a place far removed from that of the actual That's actual right. Sahaba. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Next question. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to ask you another important question to do with um, kind of Muslim relations in the West, yep. which is a big question which we do need your consultation on. Um, but this question is just because obviously it's become an area of controversy, which is the Jewish uh, Jewish question. I'm sure mm -hmm. um, you kind of suspected this. I mean, I think the area of controversy is that I don't know if you said this or not, but it seemed like what you were saying is there's, there's an impossibility of a group of people behind the wall, but. If you really think about it, it's, it's not really an impossibility, would it be? If, if you think about it being, it's not muhal aqlan, and it's not like a squared circle. Why would you have referred to it as an impossibility? And it's not actually an impossibility for there to have been a group of people out behind the wall. For there to have been or for there, or to, there to continue be? to be? Jayid. Okay. The whole issue, honestly, I think, and Allah knows best, but <sighs> Allah musta'an. Uh, what I don't like defending myself or getting involved in criticism back and forth yeah, to each his own mm -hmm. the the entire issue is, is is quite simple are we required to believe in the existence of tens of millions of people called Ya'juj and Ma'juj who are currently alive at our time but is it tens of millions or is there anything that says that it's tens of millions so the hadith mentioned that for every one of you there's like 999 of them the hadith mentioned that yeah. there are you know beyond number the the the, the issue comes of yeah. you know they're they're um uh may kulli hada bin yan silun is in the quran by the quran, way yeah. but that's in the end of times right yeah so will one could very easily extrapolate from this yeah, yeah. Text I see your of point. hadith yeah, that there's there's tens of millions, yeah. tens of millions or hundreds of millions. Could of you people. say that the hadith okay. also could? Wait, wait. Be... Let me finish yeah, this. Sorry, let me finish this, and then and then we yeah. can continue. Again, may Allah soften my hearts and the hearts of our critics, and mm. also grant us ikhlas. Sometimes I feel that some people are just hunting for mistakes and just wanting to to just you know find a a, a reason to bring yeah, you true. down. And it's true. Well. Anyway, khair, I mean it's 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 there. It's there. It's of there. Course, of course get I'm generous. not gonna say this, but may Allah guide me and guide them and make us yeah. more productive. My, I, I keep on saying this. Your main focus yeah. should not be criticizing other people. I don't think this is Islam. Mm. Yes, once in a while we need to correct mistakes in a very you know gentle manner, whatnot, but true. even then we look at the pros and cons. Yeah, of course, of course. Anyway, khair, that's their business and they have to answer to Allah and in this dunya people will judge them and that's their business. But from my perspective, I just want to say the, the question that I asked, and if you listen to the lecture with an open mind, not trying to find faults here and there, are we required to believe in the existence of tens of millions of people currently alive? I said, if you look at the Quran, Ya'juj and Ma'juj is something in the past and the future, not current, right? Dhul Qarnayn in the past. And then in the future, they're also called Ya'juj and Ma'juj. It doesn't necessarily say that they're currently alive right now. 
There is a group in the past, and it, it is possible that a similar group in the future is called Ya'juj and Ma'juj as well. Like we call a room, and we all believe that a room of the past is current Western civilization. Even though there's not an actual biological line, it's just the same fikra, the same thought. You understand yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. So, the Quran doesn't say that they're currently alive. In the hadith, as I mentioned, all of the hadith of Ya'juj and Ma'juj are about the future, except for one narration, mm -hmm. which is in Tirmidhi, which I said, I'm not the only person, a number of ulama, including Tad Ibn Kathir, yeah. 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 So I about said... About the one about the... Yes, um, the, 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 the clawing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, yani, we are not, from an usuri perspective, required to believe in the existence of Ya'juj Ma'juj currently. I never denied they existed. I never denied they will exist. Now, if the Quran and Sunnah had obliged us to believe in their current existence, Samirna wa ata'ina. Here and we obey. Okay, but now that we have come to a conclusion, a possible conclusion that yeah. we are not required to believe in them, what then do we make of these narrations? So I said there's a number of things that can be said. Of them, I quoted the Shaykh of my Shaykh, Shaykh Sa'di, right? And again, my, <laughs> I have to gently say the critics, may Allah guide them in us, in their overzealousness, refuse to do their own research to even know that Did what I said. Did you say that as well, Shaykh Sa'di? I didn't quote him because oh. it is. I don't. Sheikh Saadi said that they are they are uh, the Roman the, the Americans and, and and he said the Americans and the uh, Russians are Yajuj and Majuj. That's what Sheikh Saadi said, right? And his the ulama of his time. Is that his tafsir? Yeah, it's in, it's yeah. Had a treatise on this. Yeah. The ulama of his time complained to the king. He was called to a court trial. I mean, not a court trial, but a king trial. Yeah. He was called to Riyadh, yeah. King Abdul Aziz, mm -hmm. and the ulama and him on one side. And he defended himself from an usuri perspective, like I'm not denying the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. I don't believe that Ajuj and are, are currently behind a wall. Mm. And my tafsir is da da da. You can disagree with it, but you can't kick me out of Sunni Islam, right? Yeah. Okay. And he defended himself yeah. in a manner that none of his critics could then respond to. That's exactly what I'm humbly saying as well. I have no problems people people rejecting the opinion that I have or making fun of it in their own way. That's their business to do. Yeah. But to kick somebody out of Usul of Sunni Islam. That's I have to harsh. say this. I have yeah, to say yeah. this. These people don't know the Usul of Sunni Islam yeah, for true. them to do this. True, I'm true. sorry. Yeah. I have to be explicit here. Yeah, yeah, they true. don't know the Usul of Sunni Islam. Yeah, if they did, they couldn't have done this. Yeah. You have every right to reject and criticize. Yeah. You have every... Now, the irony, by the way, which I said, mm. in their attempt to reclaim the narrative that they believe is orthodox, uh -huh. they reinvent the narrative. Yeah. So they say, for example, what if they're under the ocean? Or what if they're hidden in <laughs> mountains? Mm. None of the classical or medieval said ulama said this. Or, and another point, believing that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are currently alive yep. is not found in any of the mutun of aqidah. It's not an aqadi issue. Mm -hmm. But these people made it an aqadi issue. But would you agree right. that, like, for example, if you call it ta'ala, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدَ الْأَخْرَةِ جَعَلْهُ وَكَانَ وَعَدَ رَبِي You could... For example, these verses, you uh, could... Of course it's possible. You could, you could understand it like I this. Never, I never dismissed yeah. it as being plausible. Legitimate, yeah. yeah. And but this was I'm the aqal of the... It was the aqal of most of our ulama. Yeah. Yes, no question about that, yeah. right? But again, and again, it's, it's up to you. As I said, if you want to believe this, that it's not mahal aqlan. I never mm. said it's mahal aqlan. But I said, from what we know of yeah. the world, geologically... Mm. You do not have tens of millions of people on the surface of the earth anywhere that we don't know about. But you could okay. interpret the hadith the 999 to 1 or whatever it is as majaz in the same way as they do with 50 well, to 1. If you're willing to start opening this door, why yeah. can't I open my door? Because the Salaf on that right. one. The no, Salaf, the salaf on, did not say 999 is no, majaz. Um, the, you know the 50 to, like for example, in the uh, last end of days, the, the, there'll be 50 women to one man. So I've seen some aqwal of the, not Salaf like, like the Salaf. But uh, there is Salaf. So uh, my point is, <laughs> there is yeah. an inconsistency then in this. Yeah. Like people are willing to change their own narrative to yeah. fit their own paradigm. Mm -hmm. When I try to do something somewhat similar, all of a sudden, yani, it becomes a aqadi issue. So, so it's a mas'ala ishtihadiyah. A mas'ala ishtihadiyah. And I have no problem you believe what you believe. Also, by the way, yeah. uh, people need to understand we have different battles that we're fighting. Mm. And my primary audience with these types of things are... Groups of skeptical, you know, second, third generation Muslims who are having a long list of shubuhat. Mm. How can I believe in these things? Yes. One of these shubuhat, and I know this for a fact, and even after my talk, I got so many emails that, okay, Zakla for opening this door now, how about these other issues? Yep. In other words, it's now making them think that, okay, this has now, I understand where this is coming from now. Can we answer these other issues as well? So my point is, believe it or not, and I believe this is successful in its own, there are groups of people, this interpretation will actually make them closer to Islam.
Mm-hmm. Make them understand, okay, you know what? Our religion is not just a bunch of mythology. They think that it is, right? There's a bunch of mythological issues we have to believe in. Because I have been asked this point blank by people that are skeptical of the faith. Not just this, a whole long list, including yeah. evolution, Darwinism, and including Ajuj and Ma'juj. So we have to present... Now, if the Qur'an is qat'i, yeah. and you know in evolution, yeah, yeah. I do not believe in human evolution. I've been very clear about this, right? Yeah, yeah. I do not believe because the Qur'an is qat'i. Mm-hmm. You cannot reinterpret the Qur'an Allah in this regard. Yeah. Too many evidences, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. But my point is, Ya'juj and Ma'juj currently being alive is not qat'i. Okay. It's not even something that is explicit in the Qur'an. So that was mm-hmm. my point. Okay. But you would agree that, that this is the bulk of the opinion, of though? Course, of course, I mentioned this, yeah. Some of our brothers, may Allah guide them, they apparently don't know English. They consider the word medieval, medieval. to be derogatory. And again, yeah, it's from 400 it's to 1400. Like, it's like, and, and, and I mean, where do you even be? They, they betray Mid- their Middle Ages. ignorance, man. Yes, there's classical, there's medieval, there's pre-modern, yeah, there's modern, antiquity, right? This antiquity, Antiquity, I mean, these are terms yeah, that people historical, use. Yeah, it's a historical term. It's, it's like, yeah, what, it, they betray their own, anyway, lack of, anyway, Allah al Let me be cautious with my words here. May Allah guide us and me and forgive me and them uh, in any regard again I continue to advise the brothers your the bulk of your output should be positive, positive guiding output. the people once in a while if you feel somebody's made a mistake there's a time a place a methodology a language yes. to, to make these corrections and the sunnah Allah fi ulama is that their contributions positively far outweigh the rudud yeah. Unfortunately, there are certain people, they feel that Rudud is the essence, is of, the Islam. essence of Islam. And yeah. I just advise them, look to history. This is yeah. not beneficial. They won't be heard. They will, they will, not, be they will not be remembered. Yeah, they won't be. And they're not contributing to the Ummah. Anyway, that's up to them. If they want to continue to do it, yani may Allah guide us in that. It's not my business to Because get you've got to very limited time, I want to ask you one, probably last question here. And this is probably one of the most important questions I'm going to ask you. And it's to do with our interaction, uh, political interactions with other Groups, sub subgroups in uh, the West. Obviously, mm-hmm. uh, in the West, we have the left wing, who in many ways are political allies of the Muslims, or uh, they want to p- ensure that Muslims have their rights, uh, or Muslim rights are ensured. And on the right, this is a very crude, right? Yeah, but yeah, on the right I, side, you there know. There is an element of truth and an element of stereotype. Right. Yes. So, um, what I was going to say was that, especially in regards to the LGBTQ issue, um, the question is now, uh, especially when we look to like America, we look to America and we see that there's Muslim activists, I'm not going to mention names, I know you don't like mentioning names, so there's Muslim activists who, for example, they would side with the LGBTQ community to the extent whereby I would say the lines may be blurred between what's, uh, what is acceptable political um, compromise, which you've sp- spoken about like with Hudaybiyah and stuff like that, and ideological compromise. So now the, in the minds of the masses, speaking about the masses, a lot of people think, okay, well, is there a morality in, for example, man having sex with man, or woman having sex with woman, if that's even possible from an Islamic perspective. So these things, the question of, is it moral, has become a question in the uh, imagination of lots of Muslim people in the, in, the, in the Western world. How, my question to you is, how do we move forward and engage politically with, uh, different subgroups of the Western society in a way which doesn't compromise our own teachings in an ideological way? Your question is one that cannot be answered in five minutes and it cannot be answered by one person. Okay. You will find a spectrum of opinions. Right. And I will try my best to summarize. And again, uh, to the audience once again, this is a short, brief summary. Please don't take on a phrase and then extrapolate my, my full meanings. If yes. there's any misunderstanding, Listen to my other lectures about these issues. This is a short interview. We all have a role to play. And ulama are not the same as politicians. Right? And the ulama have a responsibility in the eyes of Allah to be much more, for lack of a better term, pure. Much more clear-cut. But there are other people who, who are a part of our community and they don't represent the theology or the, or the legal rulings of our community, but they consider themselves to be a part of our community and they decide to go different ways, right? They don't really care much about what me and you have to say about the topic because they're not representing the faith as a tradition. They're representing the community as a person of the community. We have to be mature enough, and I'm being careful with my words, to understand that even if we disagree with some of their stances, yes. we actually end up benefiting from a lot of what they do. Mm-hmm. Okay? Even if we disagree with some of their stances, and even if me and you as 
people who inshallah are more a part of the scholarly tradition would never do what they're doing. Even if we wouldn't take that path or form those alliances and loyalties, regardless of our position, the fact that they do that comes back to us and benefits us as a community and gives us more political rights. So this is the conundrum that we have. We can criticize as much as we want and to a level we do need to criticize. But even in that criticism, we need to be mature enough to understand that our Prophet ﷺ said, sometimes Allah helps this religion with a... with a... Uh, fajr. With fajr. With a fajr, mm. right? It doesn't justify the mm. fujur of the fajr, mm. right? But what do we do when we end up benefiting from what this community or this group of activists or this politicians do? It's a very nuanced discussion. Here's the question. Now, I, I now think, by the way, this yeah. is not a justification I, I know, I know. to be very clear. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But I'm saying... In our harshness and beating them and punching them yeah. metaphorically, right? Yes, yes. And I say we don't like you guys for. I'm talking about the Muslim activists, not the other community. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying yeah, yeah. I have to be careful with my words here. The the allies of that community from our ranks, right? We're so harsh on them. Fair enough, but we also have to, have to recognize we benefit from what they're doing. Uh, okay. what, what I would ask is that there's, this is a game of maslaha and mafsada really, isn't it? So it's, we were looking at the maslaha and the mafsada, and that's why we're trying to weigh up. Okay, is the maslaha here is actually more or less than a mafsada. But the question is that, from a Dawi perspective, if someone comes and says, well, look at these people, they claim to represent the Muslim community, and they're saying that they don't have a problem with, I don't know, abortion issues or yeah. homosexuality issues or whatever, uh, in a way that no Muslim would agree with. Excellent. They're using taqiyya. Excellent. Let me, let so me, let me trust be very community. clear here. Yeah. If a Muslim says that Islam allows these things and yes. Islam allows what is clearly not applicable, right? This is something that we need to have zero tolerance and compromise for. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem saying this is beyond the red line. We cannot support or endorse anybody who is basically wanting to change the religion of Allah subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. It is more problematic and more nuanced. And I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm not pronouncing a verdict, but I'm saying we need to be mature and brave enough to differentiate between that person yes. versus the one who says, I'm not speaking as a Muslim. I'm speaking as an American, as a British or whatever it might be, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying our country and its laws should give freedom to this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. And the person happens to be a Muslim or a hijabi or a brother by the name of Muhammad or Sadiq or somebody like this, okay? Yeah. And they're saying, as a citizen, as a politician, as a mayor, let me allow freedoms for all of these people. They don't bring in Allah and His Messenger, mm -hmm. okay? I think we need to be brave enough to differentiate between the two because there is a difference between the two. Now, I'm yeah. not saying what they're doing is right, yes, yes. but the first category is clear-cut. But you're, you're saying that if they go against some of the, the primary principles of Islam, wh in whatever tongue they speak in, that that's unacceptable. So, for example, if they say that, like, well, I don't know, uh, uh, homosexual sex is, is morally permissible, morally permissible, or that, that abortion is definitely that is definitely months. crossing the red line. Yeah, yeah. But if they say that the politics of this country should not interfere in the personal lives in the bedrooms, right? This yeah. is a language that is yeah, yeah, yeah. much better yeah, yeah, yeah. than the first one. Yeah. And even if I don't like it, mm -hmm. we can we we have to be brave and mature enough to say that's not the same thing. I get it, but why, why is it that we find that a lot of Christians in America, in the Bible Belt and so on, Republican Christians, neoconservatives, they're very open about what they believe in. And Muslims, they take a more... I disagree disguise. with you. I disagree with you. The, the LGBT issue, even amongst the right wings in America, is basically now, it's not a cause amongst them. Hmm. And you do not find the mainstream, the, 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 the Republican Party, this issue is now... Now, Fizzled away. the same as, as the de Democrats by and large, right? So mm -hmm. this issue is no longer a major issue. Now you will find some small fringe Christian mm -hmm. groups, but mainstream Republican Party, mainstream right wing, the LGBT is now similar to the left wing by mm -hmm. and large. Wow. It is not, look at Pence and all of these, guys. look mm -hmm. at all of them, then, you know, their, their sons and daughters, whatever, some of them, it's a, mm -hmm. this is the way now it is now. It is now not something that is taken up by any major party. So our position, especially in America, becomes even more compounded. Remember, in England, you guys are a much larger percentage. You guys are three, four, five, six percent. Mm -hmm. We in America are less than one percent. Right. Less than one percent. Right. So again, my gentle advice to the British du'at and critics and whatnot, <laughs> yes, please. stick with your own group. Yes. 
we have different masalih and mafasid in America. Mm -hmm. You don't know what we live in. Mm -hmm. Let the American du'at, and especially the du'at, not just some kid in the street in his computer room who thinks he has, <laughs> no. Yeah. Let the du'at and the preachers who are active mm -hmm. criticize each other. They know. But with that. respect, there's and one, so, there's one issue just, though. There's a lot of what happens with you guys in, the, in, in America has an effect on us in, in England. Yeah, yeah, but then you criticize though it, is, is ha it has an effect on within your camp. You, yeah. you figure out your own ways. Okay. We in America have our own masalih and mafasid because mm. our different situation is different. Mm -hmm. Our situation is very different. Yeah. And we, by and large, amongst our scholarly community, amongst the active du'at, yes have taken a stance about specific individuals that it is not in our maslaha to, to go cut off them. from them. Okay. It's not in our maslaha. Yes. We gain more by them being with us. And we, alhamdulillah, are very clear that we do not agree with that, them on these issues. Yes, we are very clear. Okay. But to cut off from them and to warn against them. No, we benefit politically with allying with certain people, but we don't tell them to give khutbas. We don't tell them to give our fatawa. Yeah, right. of course not. Yeah, so yeah. we're weighing the masalah and mafasid. Now we could be right or wrong, but in the end of the day, if you know your usul, this is an ijtihadi matter, and you cannot make tabdir on an ijtihadi matter. Yeah, of course not. No. Well, well, we're not. We're not. Well, we're not in that. We're not in that extremist group. I understand, group of, but <laughs> some of the youth are a bit quick and hasty yeah, yeah, in this course. regard. Yeah. So to be clear, anyone who miss interprets the religion of Allah yes. intentionally yes. and says that Allah allows khamar, Allah allows uh, uh, liwat, Allah allows kada wa kada, we say this person has nothing to do with Islam. We cut off from it. So would you would we ever see a time, where, I'm not going to mention names, but like where, let's say the scholarly class, um, who's represented by yourself and Amr Suleiman, these individuals that are doing great work, would we ever see a time where, yeah, you make it very clear by name and mention those individuals that that are activists in your country that they said this xyz this is our stance this this is the islamic stance um we this is incorrect from an islamic perspective would we ever see that kind of of course we have i have done this multiple times even yeah. here in england i did it there's a, yeah. a famous american activist i don't want to mention he's but a hijabi well known very very you know positive politically representing islam but some of her alliances and views and whatnot are perhaps somewhat problematic and yes. we've had me and herself we're actually friendly and we have had public friendly back and forth i'm not going to call it debate where i have publicly said look i understand Who, no need to mention oh, okay, names okay. Oh, no, it's like, yani. uh, i have publicly public, said you know yeah. well the the interview there is okay. public so actually the, you're right this is public so it's linda so okay. right yeah and here in england we actually had a a, a nice yani, conversation about this like look yeah. i said i understand what you're doing and I disagree with these issues because yeah. you do you do give an ambiguous message when yeah. you say politically we don't want the American government to get involved and you never bring I said she, she, we know this she never brings in Islam she never says Islam allows this she never says this right so I said I appreciate that that you and she herself you know she's not wanting to reinterpret the faith that's not her job or role mm -hmm. but she's saying politically I want the government to not get involved right the private issues between men and women or whatnot this is not the government's role to do their freedom is our freedom basically their freedom to do whatever is our freedom to do that I say I understand this but it is also please understand that we also find issues problematic with this yes. and of them is you do send a double message to our younger kids exactly yeah. right so we said this publicly on stage in yes, America yes. And in England. And what's, so what, was her, what was her reaction to that? I mean, in the end of the day, she's not a, a sheikh or alim, and she doesn't claim to be. Yes. She's a political activist. Yes, yes. So she's, she, in her mind, she believes she has a role to play, and she thinks I have a role to play. And she said this on Al-Jazeera, by the way. Mm -hmm. On Al-Jazeera, she said, if you have any fatwa you want about these issues, go to Sheikh Yah. So she said this. Okay. Right? So she knows what she's saying when she so says. So if we just like, go to you, then you could repeal everything that she said. No, a fatwa on the issues of this from yes, a religious yes. perspective, right? She's yes. saying I'm not giving fatwas. For but do, do you know what I see from a political angle? Now I'm not talking from from mm. from a religious. I think we've covered that. I think mm. you've really done well to cover that. But the point is, I know this is probably the last thing we'll talk about. Um, from a from a political angle, I think this could be a boomerang because what could happen is that, especially the neoconservative right wing enemy, can say, "Look." I told Totally agree with yeah, you. Yeah. That's why I'm not a politician. Right, right, right. But it's easier for mashayikh and ulama and du'a to speak the truth. Yes. It's easier for us because we're not running for office or not trying to push 
politics and I'm very skeptical. I'm a, a person who's very, very like skeptical of the efficiency of politics. Are we never going right to see now. you running for office you know, in America? No, don't worry about that. You know, it's, like, <laughs> need... it's like it's a corruptive force. It yes. corrupts and it corrupts you. And yes. this is the way Sunnah al Khat in the Throughout human history, <laughs> generally speaking, <laughs> even in our own dynasties, when you look at it, right? They don't stop romanticizing. What did our own people do there? When, they, when you're in power, you have to go after your enemy. Going after your enemy, eliminate them. That's mm -hmm. what happens, right? Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, we are not in power. Yeah. Politics, almost all of it is filthy. And that's why the Khulafa al-Rashidun are the Khulafa al-Rashidun. They're the exception. Yes. They're the exception. Yes. That's why we aggrandize them. And even in the last of their times, amongst the Muslim civil war happened, right? Yes. So by and large, I am somebody who wants to avoid all of this. But those of us that are outside the field, we need to understand that there is some benefit for us when somebody does something in that world. And in order for them to do that, yes. they have to live very differently and say very differently than we do. Mm -hmm. So I'm not supporting, yes. but you never find me becoming a great enemy of the people. Yes, that I, are I, I get the, the point. Muslim it's politics. a fine balance. It's a fine balance. And that's why if you look at my Twitter and Facebook, I've never ever... Look, as long as a person wants to benefit the ummah as a civilization, right? I can't take that person as an enemy, even if I disagree with specific issues that they have. Mm -hmm. There are jittery issues, have. important issues. Yeah, but I'll, I'll disagree theologically and yes, morally, yes. but I won't cut off and yes. take that person as an enemy when they are in the long run, in some way, directly or indirectly benefiting the Ummah. We have elected politicians, and again, here I can be public, this is public. Mm. Uh, the only muhajjib in our Congress, Umar. Ilhan Umar, right? I strongly disagree yes. with many of her stances on transgender and LGBT, strongly mm. disagree, right? Yes. But in the end of the day, her presence in that auditorium and hall is a huge, huge blessing for us as a community, right? And it comes at a significant cost of our, I mean, it comes with a significant yani, benefit of our political presence, right? But can I ask? Uh, let yeah. me, uh, yeah. She's also taken on the Uyghur cause. She's yeah. also supported, you know, uh, Turkey and some of issues that, that they've done. Mm -hmm. She's also the first person to publicly bring in the issue of, of the APAC lobby. Which yeah. has opened the doors. No politician before has been as blunt. And after she came, it opened a whole door. Now, mm. a lot of khair has come. Agreed. Now, yeah. in my humble opinion, yeah. and I'm not supporting what she's done, yeah. she couldn't have done that khair without that evil that is also but there. If That's I all ask, I'm saying. If I ask a question now, if I say that that khair that you're talking about could have been done by a non-Muslim. But it wasn't. No, but like for example, we've got Jeremy Corbyn here. Mm. Well, but we don't have that. It wasn't yeah. done, number one. Number two, the fact that she is a muhajiba in and of itself and yeah. she is representative of our, of our, of our community. In mm. the sense, she's a member of our community. But it does it do the means justify the ends? In the sense that, is it okay for you to do That's this? That's why I'm not, a, I'm not a politician. Right. You ask me, yeah. no. No. But yeah. I'm not running for office, am I? Right, she's right, already right. there. Yeah, yeah. So she does, it doesn't justify the ends, but we're talking theory and abstract. Mm. Let's get to reality. She's there. Mm. Are we benefiting or not? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying here? So, next time she runs for office, should the Muslim community boycott her? Should the Muslim community vote for the non-Muslim guy? Yeah. Just because she has a view that is really wrong, but yeah. she's done all of this good for the Muslim. But then That's the, the question. The, the question is, okay, because now, it could, because we have to look at things from a Dawi perspective as well. If she's kind of muddy in the waters, and making it seem as if Islam is something which is not... That's her muddying. I'm very clear, and anybody can watch my videos. Yeah. I'm very clear and I can say publicly yeah. I don't support her in these issues. But overall, mm. is her presence better for the community or not? That's the question. For me, uh, if, I, if I was a, like a voting man in America, I would vote for a left, I'd rather vote for a left wing non Muslim than her. Because if that left wing non Muslim can do the thing without compromising well, again, the religion. You're being theoretical. Do right. we have somebody running for the same seat that is giving the same positives yeah. and not muddying the waters of Islam? Mm. If that were the case, maybe I agree with yeah, you. Yeah. What if the one running against her is a hardcore, fanatic, anti Muslim bigot, okay. which is most likely the case? Yeah. The Republican Party, right? Yeah. What if she's the Democratic nominee and we have the other guy who wants to eliminate your mosque? Yeah, yeah. So again, be practical and, be pra and leave the Masai and Mufasid to the, the people, people of, of, of the, the yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let the people of the locality decide. Yeah. And that is why none of our mainstream du'at of the, of the West have taken these individuals as enemies. Even if we publicly, I just said publicly, yeah, yeah, publicly. I disagree with them, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? I disagree. But let us decide the Masai and Mufasid. And guess what? We might be wrong, guys. We mm. might be wrong. But in the end of the day, it's our 
ijtihad to do in our localities. I'm not telling you to vote for Jeremy or Fulan or Alan or Sadiq. It's your business to do. I'm not telling you who to vote for. But I will tell you as an outsider, as an outsider, your Muslim mayor has had a positive impact on the presence of Muslims in the Gharb. I can see what you're saying, but... That's yeah. all I'm saying. We had a, we had a, we had a non-Muslim one before that was, I think it was even better. It might have been better for the city, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but the, 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 the presence of Islam yeah. in this community, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I can see what okay. you're saying. Jazakum Allah Sheikh. Well, yeah, I mean, well, it, was, it was a pleasure, and I'm sorry if I came across as a bit polemical, but... Uh, I oh think no, you're, already, you're known to be polemical anyway, so you didn't just come across. <laughs> you, <laughs> it's a part in Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding with that. Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah Khair. You know, every time you come to the UK... Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And, uh, Alhamdulillah. This also shows, and I know that we agree on many issues, and we agreed to disagree on other yeah. issues, and I want to also make this, this explicit point to the audience, yeah. is that Look, our religion has always had a diversity of opinion from day yes, one. Yes, yes. And the true mu'min and Muslim who loves Allah and His Messenger and meets another person who loves Allah and His Messenger finds a way to see what is in common before they see what is different. And even if we disagree about some issues, that should come from a, a perspective of love and Absolutely, mercy. Yeah, yeah. And, and alhamdulillah. And this is the point. This alhamdulillah. Is the point. And I was with some of the Mashaikh yesterday, uh, Sheikh Haytham and others were there. Alhamdulillah, we agreeing to disagree about many issues. We uh, met with other du'at as well. I mean, uh, you know, Sheikh Akram, another way, um, mm -hmm. by the way, there's, I, I disagree with nothing from Sheikh Akram as of yet. MashaAllah, he is my Sheikh and your Sheikh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But alhamdulillah, we, all, we should all understand that people have different manahij that are within mainstream Islam and my, my perspective yeah, is look at the good and concentrate on the good and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive our zalat. All of us have zalat, by the way. Of course, I will have my mistakes, public and private, even my fiqhi and, and maybe even yani, aqadi issues. Maybe I'm wrong in some issues, right? Still, look at the positive and negative. That's a beautiful look message at, to end look, as well. Look, like, look at everything that the person does. And this is yeah. my philosophy as well with other people. Yes. Concentrate on the khair that they give to And you're Allah. saying this after 20, 30 years of research and going through all of the bumpy roads. How, how can anybody claim to have arrived at the haq with a capital haq? Yeah. <laughs> How can anybody? Yeah. But we try, we try, we yeah. try. And we yeah. ask Allah for hidayah and ask Allah for mouth for our zalla, inshaAllah. We amen, ask amen. Allah to keep our hearts united and to amen. always be yani, in this world. Amen. Ya Rabbullah, Ya Rabbullah. Ya Rabbullah. Jazak Mullah Khair. It's a pleasure. Allah is my favorite one. meeting, by the way, but Alhamdulillah, we, we clicked, mashallah. Yeah, Allah, big time, big time. Alhamdulillah. Jazak Mullah Khair. May Allah bless you, Sheikh. We're at the green room. We, we have to, we had to meet the, the legend of the dawah and someone who uh, was a pioneer. Um, in this field and alhamdulillah I'm not that old, don't make me that old I'm 40, <laughs> I was like, When I'm 70 you can say these words But uh, when I'm 40, someone who preceded you by a decade or two That's all, okay, I'm fair not enough. Uh, don't Keep me in my place <laughs> Okay, you know, okay. The Sheikh has clarified lots of things Alhamdulillah, which I'm really happy to have done with him And, um, and we've talk, talked about so many issues here And make sure inshallah that you keep tuned for additional episodes of The Green Room Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I think that was good. Alhamdulillah, I need to literally go and get ready. Alright, so to continue the discussion on the, uh, on the political points that we made, someone could argue, right, obviously maybe polemic or whatever you want to call me, right? Someone could argue that, okay, well look, um, actually voting for someone like Ilhan Omar or someone like that is more problematic because you're, it's like you're doing, you're, you're, Oh, uh, you're pushing her towards so, what she's saying which Jayin, could be, and yeah. I understand this and I'm not negating it I'm not dismissing it there's yeah. an element of truth yeah. and that's why it's awkward right yeah. this is not a call of haqq and batil about whether we should vote for people or not it's a spectrum of opinion yeah. and again the talib al-ilm mutamakkin the shaykh the alim the faqih understands what is clear cut yani haqq and batil and what mm. is a grey area mm. and this is one of those grey areas where you will find a number of opinions and we should be wise enough to to tolerate and understand even if we appreciate one over the other so those who say that it is problematic to vote for these types of candidates fully sympathize with that and fully at one level agree with it the opposite side is those who say well the alternative is fulan and fulan wants to ban your presence the alternative is nothing and nothing means x y and z and they say in their position in mind mm -hmm. that that is the lesser of two evils that also has a haq and a correct paradigm who will decide in the end of the day which of these masala and mafasad outweighs the other it really is ijtihadi in the yeah. end of the day but because if, yeah. weighing masala and mafasad is not qat'iyya Mm -hmm. It is Bundy. If I was asked now if there could be a slippery slope in the, in the sense that 
this person, say for example, I'm not saying Lha Amr particularly because I don't know her politics too much, or Linda Sasura or whoever else. I don't know. I have not done this to of the Aqwal. Yeah, but what I mean is, some someone like this, because right now, one of the controversies is that some individuals, I'm not sure if it was them or not, they came out with Aqwal about the Hudud of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, uh, uh, and and like kind of doing inkar of them or something like negating the the punitive punishments in the in an outright sense, not in an usuli sense, like. In a Nusuli sense, if someone said, okay, well, it's not applicable today, it's not applicable now, it could be conceived otherwise, all of those things I fully appreciate, but if they're coming and attacking it head on in that manner, and now we have the religious class backing those individuals, it's almost, it's not an endorsement because you'll be clear that, okay, we don't take that uh, position, but it's kind of tasjia, it's kind of like encouragement for them to continue in their course of, in a sense, muddying the waters from a Dawi perspective. I, and I agree with this and I sympathize with it again. Yeah. And I say again, yeah. what you're saying is valid and right. Yeah. I flip it around and say the other group is going to say, sure, but the alternative is da 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 da. And still, in spite of these ideologies or, 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 or whatnot, for the Muslim communities of our cities and countries and lands that we live in, this particular person is still beneficial despite this aspect of bid'i or kufri or whatever that might be. So here the masla has to be defined okay, because now when we say beneficial, I think what we're talking about is political benefit. But the question would be then, what is of what's a higher maslaha? The maslaha of uh, because you can, like in the books of Usul Fiqh and stuff, they actually do taqseem of maslaha into maslaha ukhrawiya or like dunyawi maslaha versus ukhrawi maslaha and so on. So one could argue well, the ukhrawi maslaha that's should... that's a valid argument yeah, yeah. and I sympathize with it. Yeah. Again, I say this is a spectrum. The yeah. flip side is, of what use is this debate if the Muslim community is no longer existing in the country? Yeah. The flip side is, if they're going to ban the immigration of Muslims, if they're going to want to shut down our masajid, if they're going to criminalize... Is it that deep? Is that that deep, do you think, in, in, in America? like that? Would, do you think well, it would I ever mean, go Trump down? Trump tried to do some very radical things. He was successful in some and not in others. But the point is, this trend, if we don't check it now, it'll yeah. be it'll be continue to exacerbate the situation. And we do not want to go down that route. It's been only one generation, one generation, when the Japanese-Americans were rounded up and thrown into concentration camps in America. Mm -hmm. In America. Mm -hmm. I don't think British people People are aware of this that in the 1940s right every single person of even one-fourth Japanese heritage was literally rounded up in the middle of the night the police came this is people are still alive from that time frame. but this was still right. World War II though it's, it's within World a war, war context yeah. yeah still still mm. we are terrified because Allah knows that the point is these types of things you know they they are potentially possible mm -hmm. our point is many of us say we need to fight tooth and nail before it gets to that dramatic stage. We need to fight right now when things are a little bit better so that they don't, they don't get worse. So for example, if somebody says the niqab ban is trivial as long as they don't go for the hijab, we say no. The niqab, if you're going to ban that, it's not good to do because the next step is you're going to keep yeah. on doing it. I've, so, got, I've got another question. Sorry, go ahead, continue. So, so yep. my point is, yep. look, I'm not endorsing her as a candidate. By the way, yeah. I, I personally haven't voted yeah. because I really have, I have my own reasons. I don't think it's haram to vote, but I've never voted. You know, and I just I I say Muslim. Should all, all, but I would say yeah. I would say yeah. in states where every vote is essential, I would vote yes. Mm -hmm. But I've never been in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The demographics are too large in the states I've been in. It's a very clear cut majority. I've got a question, Sheikh. Like for example, what I've noticed in the American Dawa is that a lot of people came before. And they made very clear that their position of taqlid, like for example, Hamza Yusuf, like he was Maliki, Muqallid. Now, the, the language of taqlid or following the scholars, whoever it may be, like in your case, obviously when you came out of Medina, it was more the Saudi scholars. Obviously, now that's changed. But with uh, those individuals, they used to be taqlidi in other madha madhabi forms. Now we're moving away from the language of taqlid and following the scholars to the language of ishtahad. Now, my only issue is that now who determines who is the mujtahid in the uh, in the American context. Let me flip it around. Who determines who's the mujtahid in the Muslim context? There's always a, yes. a contesting of authority. Yeah, yeah. It always happens. Look at Pakistan. Look at Egypt. Yeah. Is it one? Just because the governor appoints the Grand Mufti, does everybody say think he's the Grand Mufti? Mm -hmm. And we all know that's a siyasi yeah. appointment, right? True, true. So the same issues that apply in the Sharq, uh, Gharb apply in the Sharq as well. We, yeah. we don't have a agreed upon hierarchy in like a magisterium Islam, or yeah. which we thank yeah. Allah for we don't want what happened in the Catholic yes. Church or with yes. other firaqa of one person or what we don't want that yeah. there's a healthy diversity of opinion and in the end of the day every Muslim will gravitate towards that spectrum and that group of people and their mashayikh that he looks up to
Yes. There's no problem with that. That's the way it has always been. And so, so the same yeah. goes for the Gharb. Yeah, for the Sharq. The, the same goes for the Sharq, yeah, excuse me. Um, but what I was going to say was that, um, so now, in terms of, because like you said before, there's the democratization of uh, knowledge and so on and so forth. Anyone can come out and say, I'm a Alim, I've been a Mufti and so on and so forth. How do we ensure that the right people I mean, what methods would you advise for a layperson in order to be able to distinguish between the internet taught kind of sheikh, which there, to be honest with you, a lot of people who acquire their qualifications fully over the internet and they just go like watch lectures and so on and then khalas and, and they, they can now become mushtahid and the, someone who's uh, done a training. By the endorsement of their peers, by the endorsement okay. of the people around them. Right. So look at a person and his circle of knowledge around him, mm -hmm. okay? and. I might disagree with, for example, a person on the Sufi side, but I will not negate their knowledge and their right to give fatwa. True, true. I, might, I might disagree with their taqlidi position, that full-term Maliki or Hanafi, but if somebody has gone through a Darul Ulum Deoband course 10 years, becomes a Mufti, he yeah. has every right to make ijtihad, yeah. even if I disagree with it, right? Oh, if a person studies yeah. in Mauritania and comes out to Maliki and reciting Warsh and yani, yeah. Qira'a, well, Alhamdulillah, he has every right to make ijtihad, yeah. even if I don't agree with it, but you will find me endorsing his legitimacy to give fatwa. Yes. And I know he will do the same to me and others. Yeah. Whereas most of these internet, yani, you know, wannabes, nobody really, yani, they are not people of knowledge anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so they're not, but but the problem comes, well, me and you can say as much as one, their speaking style and their antics online will we'll gather, get, we'll get the we'll controversy. gather their followers. Yeah. And khalas, let them. Look, bro, I've never, yani, since my Medina days, I've never made it a priority to defend myself or to get involved in these. I've never made it a priority. Mm. And I firmly believe that mm. One of my earliest teachers said this to me. It's advice I always stick with. He said, you be sincere in your own da'wah and Allah will bless it. Mm. Let the detractors detract. Let the critics criticize. You give your da'wah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah azza wa will take care of the rest. And that mm. has been my guiding philosophy for over 20 years of da'wah. I have never and I never intend to make it a priority to get involved in polemics and in defending and in refuting. Mm. I have my da'wah that I want to give. I'm teaching the seerah. Mm. Now I'm teaching the barzakh, teaching the lives of the sahaba. Mm. In all of this that I've done, there is no question that there are mistakes. How can mm. there not be? I'm a bashar, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have thousands of hours. You're not going to find a mistake, a mm. zalla, a khata, an Your, your seerah is how many right? hours is that? Over a hundred and it's like a hundred and five episodes, and each one is an hour and something. So, how long? 140, 50 hours. I, I know people that are very to you. Listen, to this. Are yeah. you gonna tell me that yeah. this human effort does not have a mistake in it? Of yeah. course, it has a mistake yeah. Yeah. or mistakes in it, but insha'Allah. Insha'Allah, mm. the khair is Our, insha Allah, ways, much, obviously, much obviously. more. That's my yeah, goal, right? Yeah. And even the ara that I hold, ya khi, every alim in human history has had a position or two that is yani, a little bit here and there. You think I'm going to be any different? Of course yeah. I have my mistakes yeah. or not. The goal is insha'Allah, awal in ikhlas, thani in qabool with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and thalithan, wa amma ma yanfa'u nasa fayamkuth for You want to benefit the people with the most that you can, mm. so that when you leave this world, the legacy that you have is insha'Allah, a positive legacy. That is the ultimate goal. Mm. So if someone wants two to... Minutes left, brother, we're one minutes last ahead. question, uh, since we've got two By minutes By the way, left. for the camera, we're headed to the airport and I'm going to the, my flight now, so our brother <laughs> volunteered to drop us. Zakallah khair. Oh, he wanted course. to spend more time with me, so Zakallah khair for 100%. volunteering for this. Alhamdulillah. I was going to ask, um, as a final question, someone who now, because we get a lot of people, alhamdulillah, off the streets, a lot of people into Islam new, and they just want to get started in a very basic way with learning Islam. I know this is a very basic question, um, but what is the what are the first steps? What are the things that they're thawab it that for, for a fact they can anchor themselves in terms of study on? The first things that they should do yep. is to learn the basics of their sharia and their theology yes. and the tafsir of the Quran that they read. Three yes. simple things, right? Yes. How do you worship Allah? Start off with the base. Go to your local sheikh and whatever madhab he has, no big deal. Follow it. Mm. Just learn the basics. How to do wudu, how to pray. That knowledge will bring about a khushur and a sense of, of a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Learn the tafsirs of the Quran that you're reciting. It's very important. Mm. It's an, a neglected, simple topic is tafsir. Just yeah. read the Quran and understand its meaning. And mm -hmm. then obviously, of course, the basics of theology as well. Learn to build the and, and, and again, take your shaykh, no problem. But don't make your sheikh the cult of Islam. Yes. Okay. Take a madhab. That's no one of problem. the issues that we do that have. That is one of the issues yes. that your sheikh becomes the end all and be all. Yes. 
look, we cannot reinvent the wheel in totality. Mm. I've said this explicitly. If you become a Maliki, if you become a Salafi, if you become an Ash'ari, if you become a you know Ghazali and Sufi, I don't have any issue. You're within the mainstream, alhamdulillah. But don't hate on other firaq and other groups that have been around within mainstream Sunnism. As for non-Sunni Islam, let the ulama deal with them. And even then, don't hate on the average Muslim of another group that is praying to Allah mm. and, and loving the messenger, right? Mm -hmm. Even then, I say, it's not the job of the average Muslim to exacerbate the situation, even if we disagree with the theologies of, of non-Sunni Islam, if you get my drift. Mm. I've got a question, which will probably be the last question I'll ask you. What ulama do you look up to now in the Shaykh world? Saman yeah. Number one in my heart is Sheikh Saman Al-Awda. Yeah. May Allah Azza wa Jal release him from the situation that he is in. He is my Sheikh, haqiqatan wa majazan. Mm. I know him personally, I've visited him many times personally, he knows me personally. And um, he is somebody that I genuinely look up to as being the Shaykh al-Islam of our time. He who, is who, the Shaykh al-Islam of else? our time. Who else? What would you think of someone like um, Muhammad Walid al and those in the Definitely region? somebody I look up to and I love. Yeah. I respect immensely. Mm -hmm. respect immensely. And mm -hmm. I do listen to some of his fatawa mm -hmm. and tafsirs too. Yani, you know, one of the few people that I'm still listening to now. Because, not because I just know time. But yani, mm -hmm. some of the people that I still have time, I make sure Shaykh yani, Walid al And mm -hmm. I met him a few times. I don't mm -hmm. think he would remember me, by the way. But uh, I don't. Maybe he does. His memory is amazing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Memory. So yeah. maybe he does remember. I met him a number of times in, yeah. in, in Saudi when I was there. Because when I was studying in Medina, he was studying in Riyadh. Mm -hmm. you know, of course, senior to me, mm -hmm. but he was studying in Riyadh. So we met a few times. But believe it or not, I have not met him since those days. But definitely, Sheikh. Okay. 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 Uh, Kem Who else Kemli? <laughs> Uh, I have never met him, and I've he's, he's I've young heard, as well. He's, he's very what impressive. I've heard, for mashallah, very impressive, mm -hmm. very impressive, mashallah, very impressive. Mm. Have you met? You haven't met him yet. No, I never met him. It doesn't. Mm. It didn't happen. Yani, ma uti halil fursa. Yani, you guys in England have much more visits, you know, than, than yeah, I don't know, I don't know, three drop off. طيب جزاكم الله خيرا شيخ. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال